Welcome everyone. We'll just give everyone a minute or two to get on and get set up. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Caitlin Mivas. I'm the Director of Preservation at the Landmark Society of Western New York. Thank you all for joining us on a very cold Monday morning. Um, hopefully most of you did not have to leave your house uh, to, to join us this morning. Um, so we'll be talking about the round two applications for the Genesee Valley Rural Revitalization Grant program that we're administering on behalf of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. We call this grant giver for short. So if you hear us say giver, that, that's what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, I will turn it over to my colleague, Megan Clem with the Landmark Society. If you have questions throughout, please put your questions into the chat. I will be keeping track of them and we'll probably just go through all of them at once at the very end. So feel free though to to be putting them in the chat and we will be keeping track. And as a reminder, we are recording this webinar. It will be up on our website if you have to duck out early or you know anyone who wasn't able to make it. So I'll turn it over to you, Megan. Thanks, Caitlin, and welcome everybody. Thank you again um, for attending this. We're gonna try to keep it to about an hour. So we'll try to do about a half hour presentation, maybe a half hour for questions at the end. So. Um, we'll kind of run through this, and I know some of this will be repeat information if you're someone who applied during round one, um, but just as a little upfront, we did make some changes to round two, um, mostly to be more helpful to our applicants, make things make a little more sense for you, um, and, and just hopefully make the process a bit smoother this time around. So, get my slide to move forward. There we go. All right, so just a little background to start us out about this grant program. So this is, as Caitlin mentioned, the Genesee Valley Rural Revitalization Grant, or GIVER, G-V-R-R for short. This program is funded by the Paul Brun Historic Revitalization Grants Program through the Historic Preservation Fund, which is administered by the National Park Service, which is part of the Department of the Interior. Um, the Historic Preservation Fund was established in 1976 and it provides preservation grants and financial assistance to um, states and local governments, nonprofits, and other, and other partners. As I mentioned, it is administered by the National Park Service and it provides financial assistance for activities that will contribute to the planning and preservation of our built environment and our archeological resources. So the Giver Grant Program, what is the purpose of this grant? And it's to support our, our, our historic restoration and rehabilitation projects throughout the rural communities in the Finger Lakes and Western New York regions. And it preserves the historic places that have shaped our communities, their social fabric and, and their economy. And the awards will be given out in the amount of anywhere from 5,000 as the minimum award to 50,000 for capital projects. There are a few benefits to, the, to this giver program aside from being awarded funding. Awardees will also receive a membership to our Landmark Society of Western New York's affiliate program for the duration of the grant. This program provides um, net, a network of grassroots preservationists and other support networks to, to our awardees, um, and also just a link to contractors and other people who can help with those processes. The other um, benefit is that National Register listed properties can take advantage of the state and federal historic tax credit programs and other financial assistance um, programs that you'll be eligible for, as you'll find out a little later in the um, presentation that, that um, those that are awarded the grant funding do have to be listed in the National Register, but there's a little bit more on that coming up later. All right, so we're gonna jump right into eligibility for the program. Your eligible buildings are historic, commercial, industrial, civic, educational, or, or any other community-oriented building. Um, in this case, for example, it could be a church building, but it would have to be um, 
also used for the community outside of religious services or religious purposes. So that's what we mean by community oriented buildings. Uh, you do have to be located within one of these counties on your screen. I'll just read them along. They're Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Genesee, Livingston, Ontario, Orleans, Seneca, Schuyler, Steuben, Wayne, Wyoming, and Yates counties. So your building does have to be located in one of those counties. And it also needs to be within an incorporated village with a population of 4,000 people or less, or within a town with a population of 10,000 or less. Um, just to make sure people understand, if you are in a hamlet that is not an incorporated um, municipality, you're more likely, um, if you're in a hamlet, you're probably actually within an incorporated town, so you would need to use the town population. If you're within the boundaries of an incorporated village, you need to use the village population. So it has to do with the location of the building, not the organization applying. And then finally, you need to be determined eligible or already be listed in the New York State and National Register for Historic Places. Now, the caveat with that that I mentioned earlier is that if a building receives funding through the Giver Program and you're not already listed in the National Register to actually receive those reimbursable grant funds, you do have to become listed in the National Register. So clarification, to apply for the program, you don't need to be listed yet. You just need to be determined eligible but if you do receive funding, you would have to move forward with the designation as well. All right, your eligible applicants. Um, you're eligible to apply if you're a community-based nonprofit organization, a unit of local government, such as village, town, or county. Um, you're a business owner who operates within a historic building, and you either own the building, or if you don't own the building, you have permission to apply from the building owner. So that's important to note as well. If you don't own the building, you can still apply, but you need to have that permission from the building owner. And you'll see there's a spot in the application where you have that information and submit that um, approval from them. Or you can be a non-residential property owner who owns an eligible building type. So basically one of those historic building types, you own it, you most likely are eligible to apply for this program. Just um, to be aware, this program does, is not eligible to residential homeowners or state or federal agencies. So if you are a homeowner looking for something, um, assistance for your personal residence, you would not be eligible for this program. And finally, eligible projects. So again, this grant program is to fund capital rehabilitation or restoration projects, um, which include, but are not limited to those things you see on your screen right now. Um, that's anything from repair to the building envelope, the roof, masonry repair, repointing, um, window repair or replacement, storefront restoration, weatherization is an eligible expense, systems upgrades, and then um, if you need to have one done, the completion of a cultural resources survey, this would be more towards those people um, who are applying under the National Register part of this application or to have the National Register nomination done. Um, again, because you do have to be listed in the National Register or if you are just determined eligible when you apply, you do have to move forward with listing if that is your case you can include the cost um, to have that nomination completed. So that would be the cost of hiring a preservation consultant to write your nomination. You can include that in your, within your $50,000 maximum request. And then also soft costs such as construction documents and conditions assessments. Those are eligible for the grant with the caveat that only 20% of your overall grant can be put towards those costs. So there would still need to be some of these other capital expenses included with, with your application. Um, some of your ineligible projects would be things like furniture, um, site work outside of your building or landscaping. If it's a non-historic structure, it's not eligible. Um, and things like sound systems or lighting systems. Basically, if you take the building and you were to tip it upside down and shake it and had no roof, what would come falling out? That's not eligible. Things that would stay with the building attached permanently to the building would be eligible. If you have specific questions on that, you can certainly put it in the chat or ask us in the Q&A at the end, or you're welcome to reach out to me individually if you've got questions about eligibility for your anticipated project. All right, so just to run through the um, eligibility checklist, again, 
uh, location, you need to be within an incorporated village or a town meeting the population. So for village, it's 4,000 people or less. And for a town, it's 10,000 people or less. Um, and if you have questions on that, if your population is slightly above that, please reach out to me. Um, and we can let you know whether or not you still comply with that, with that eligibility requirement. Then also the National Register, you need to already be listed in the National Register or determined eligible by the State Historic Preservation Office for listing. There is um, in the application instructions information on how to get that um, determination of eligibility from the state. If that's you and you need to have that done and you've got questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can help you through that process as well. Your grant request should be anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000. And of course, of course, the 50,000 is the maximum that can be requested. Your project completion, you would need to be completed with your project within two years of the funding award. Um, so if that is something you think that you'd be able to do, great. Um, most likely you'd be looking at sometime in late 2023 when the project would need to be done. Um, it all depends on when your grant agreement with the state would be completed. Um, project compliance, the work that you're applying for does need to comply with the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Basically, that is um, the, the National Park Service put this together. It's basically 10 guidelines on the appropriate treatment for historic properties. It's just to make sure that the state and the federal investment in your property, if you're funded, um, is really maintaining and retaining the historic character of your building. Um, it's a protection you know, a protection on your building, but a protection to them for the, the finances that they give you for that. And then finally, a preservation covenant. You should be aware that if you are awarded the giver grant, there would need to, um, there would be a preservation covenant put on your property, and that's a term preservation covenant. Basically, what that means is that if you're doing anything beyond just general maintenance to the building, it would have to go through review at the state. Um, if you're funded or if you've got questions on that, we can give you more information. But generally, the term of your preservation covenant, it wouldn't be forever, but it would depend on how much um, on how much money you are receiving through the grant program kind of correlates with how long that term would last. Okay, general grant conditions. This um, does require a competitive bidding for consultants or contractors because it's a state and federal um, grant program. However, they are a bit more relaxed than um, some other grant programs have been for the state. So if you have applied for other state grants before, um, it's not going to be as intensive as other programs are. Um, your funded projects do, again, require a term preservation covenant following the completion of the project, and that term will be based on your grant amount that, you're, that you receive. So again, we wouldn't have specifics for you right now on how long that will last. It really depends on how much you receive and then the state works that with you through the grant agreement process. Um, funded projects do require signage about the grant funding during, um, during the process of, of doing the work. That is something that you would get a, um, a template from a state on what needs to be on that sign. So it's not anything that you need to worry about right now, just be aware of that. And then also the property owner must pursue National Register of Historic Places listing if the property is not already designated. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the application. And as I mentioned, for those of you who applied during round one, we have slightly changed the round two application um, not necessarily in, in what we're asking, but more how we're asking to make it a little bit more straightforward. So to start, I do want to make sure everyone knows when you do request the application, please make sure that you read through the application instructions and the submission instructions carefully. Um, those do need to be followed. If you don't submit the application according to that, we won't be able to accept it. The round two application deadline is March 31st of this year, 2022 by 11.59 p.m. Um, applications will be emailed to gvrr at landmarksociety.org. Please do make sure that you only use that email for the submission of your final application. Otherwise, that is not a monitored email. It's for the final application submission only. Um, your applications do need to be completed and signed electronically. Um, in the first round, I think we did allow some handwritten if you needed to. 
we have changed that in this round here. So it does need to be completed electronically. If you aren't sure how to do that or need help, um, it's a good idea to find somebody, whether that's somebody with the county, your town, your village, um, a friend, somebody who knows how to do that and, and have their assistance with that. And then of course, um, Landmark Society staff, we're available for um, technical guidance and general application assistance. We can't help you fill in your application, but we can answer questions. Um, and as you'll see later, we, we did send out originally that site visits should be requested by January 15th. Even though we're past that date, you are still welcome to reach out to me and request a site visit. Um, and we'll try to fit that into our calendar with plenty of time for you to complete your application. Please do be aware though with site visits, we're trying to limit those to projects that are more complicated or have a lot of work that needs to be done and you need some help determining what is the best course of action to apply for in this grant funding round. So not all projects require a site visit. You are not required to have a site visit to apply. So if you have something that's a little more straightforward, like a roof replacement, then we may just talk to you over the phone about it um, because a site visit may not change really what's happening. So please do be aware of that. You're not required to have a site visit and we could just ask for a phone call if it's not something that truly needs us to look at the building to be able to give you guidance on. Okay, so jumping into the application and um, what you'll be filling out, we start again with a historic resource section. And this again is where you'll be putting in the property name. Um, a lot of people had questions about that in the first round. So the property name can be anything from the property's address to a, a name that the building is commonly known as. Not every building has a historic name. So be aware of that. You could even call it, if you own the building, you can use your name and call it your name building. Um, it really is whatever the building is most commonly known as. Then you have your historic, your historic current and proposed use. Um, so if the building was historically a tavern, now you're using it as a, um, as a store and the proposed use, you'll be keeping at the store, you're just doing some work, then you would, those would both be the same thing. Date of construction, if known, um, it's an approximate date. You don't need to go doing a ton of research to find out when your building was constructed. Um, or you can contact us for some assistance if you're not quite sure what to do about that. But again, it doesn't have to be a pinpoint specific date, just approximate. And then the National Register status. We do have a, a box you'll need to check letting us know if you are already listed in the National Register or if you have your determination of eligibility from the state. Um, Again, if you're not sure if your building is already listed in the National Register, there are some instructions in on how to find that out. But if you prefer, you're welcome to reach out to me. I can get you that information pretty quickly. All right, then we move into the applicant um, organization. And I do just wanna say before I go through this, if you are someone who has already reached out to me and already received the application, please check this section at section two applicant in the, in the application. We did have a few people that ran into some issues because fields, um, fillable fields had the same name under a few things. And so it was automatically populating other areas of the application that we didn't want it to. We have since fixed it. So this is only for those of you who already have the application. If you can check section two, I can send, resend you the application if it's doing that for you as well. Otherwise, if you are going to be asking for the application, you'll be getting the, the fixed version. So we start with the applicant or organization. That's who's applying for the funding. Um, for example, if you're a nonprofit, uh, the name of the organi organization or the organization's general contact information. Um, and then you have your applicant or organizational contact. That is who with the organization, the business, the ownership group, who is it that is going to be the main contact for this grant program? Then you'll include a project contact. So this is someone who is working with you on the project. They will be the main person that I'll be reaching out to about this project throughout the application process. This project contact can be the same person you've used for the applicant organization contact, or it can be a different person, um, but should be whoever is going to be able to be the person we reach out to with questions. Then if you are applying from a, a municipal standpoint, we would like you to include um, the person associated with the local government um, that is the contact there. 
Um, if you are just a, a property owner, commercial property owner, whatever that is, and your project really has nothing to do with the municipality, you don't necessarily need to fill in that contact information. Uh, then we will ask a question um, under project dis discussion to see whether or not you've talked with us about your project. Um, again, that is not a requirement that you reach out to us and talk to us about your project, but definitely something we highly recommend. Number one, that makes sure that your project is eligible for the program and that there aren't any major red flags that we have about the proposed work being eligible. Um, but also just make sure that we know that you're applying and that everything is good to go ahead of time. Then you'll also need to check off your applicant status if applicable. That's a 501c3. That's if, if you're any type of 501c3, check that box. Um, whether you're a unit of local government or a private property owner. And then ownership. There is a section where you'll fill in contact information for the owner of the building. You only need to fill that out if you are not the owner and you have to get the owner permission. And then finally, there's a section where you can put in, um, we ask if there's any local preservation organizations where you are. So that could be a local historical society, um, preservation oriented organization or a development organization in your town or village. Um, again, that is not something that has to be filled in. That's more for our purposes. We are trying to make sure that we know where all of our local partners are so we can reach out in the future with programs like these and make sure we're spreading the word appropriately. Okay, then we'll get into the application with the project description. And you'll see in the round two application, a few of these sections, there's going to be a portion that's for repair and rehabilitation projects. And then there will also be somewhat similar questions asked under project description that will be for if you're doing a survey or national register application. Um, so just be aware of that as you're filling out the application, there may be sections of that that get, get left blank because it doesn't have anything to do with what you're applying for. So under project description for repair and rehabilitation projects, you're going to describe all of the work that's ongoing at the property. That's everything that you're doing right now and everything that you anticipate doing in the future. Um, within reason, we're not asking forever and ever. Um, so basically during your grant project, what is already happening now and what do you plan to do? Then you'll give us a description of the grant funded work you're applying for. So first box is for everything ongoing at the building. The second box is for what exactly are you applying for grant funding for? So be aware that that second box for the grant funded work, that's the only work you'll be able to receive reimbursement for. Um, so even if you list out a bunch of work items in that description of all work section, you can only receive grant reimbursement for what is in your, your description for grant funded request. Then you'll also include a description of the building conditions. Um, the reason this is important is it helps the grant review panel understand the real need at your property, which is part of what gets ranked and rated during their review of your application. Um, so that's just general descriptions. You don't have to get into super detail, but you want to be detailed enough to really give that framework and that, um, that perspective for the grant review panel who may not have ever been to your building before to really understand um, what's going on there. Then you'll include um, a little description on the importance to maintain the function and use of the building or return to use of the building. Um, we wanna know if you're already, if you already have the building in use and you're applying for funding, how will this funding help you keep that building in, in use? For example, if you have a leaking roof and it's causing a lot of interior water damage, which you know, can do damage to your systems, it can do damage to the ability to have a store or whatever that is, um, and your building open, talk about that, that you, you would need this funding in order to keep the building open to stop damage from happening. Um, or if the building's not in use, but what you're applying for will bring that building into use for your community, talk about that. Then a professional building assessment. We would like to know if you've had somebody look at the building so that you know, especially for those of you that will be applying for more structural type work, um, that you've had somebody like a structural engineer take a look at your building so that you know that that really is the best course of action this work that you'll be applying for. Then you'll include your project timeline. This is just a, an estimated timeline. It doesn't need to be exact. Um, basically, we just want to know that you would be able to start the project once you're fully, um, fully approved by the state 
and that you would be able to get that project done within that two year time frame. Um, so just kind of how you're how you'll make that happen. And then the final part of, of this portion of the application are construction drawings, conditions, assessments and specifications. If you are applying for work to, for example, <clears throat> to the front of this to the storefront of your building and you'll be putting in a new your storefront's been reworked in the past and you want to bring it back to a more historically appropriate configuration, we would need to see architectural drawings of what that storefront's going to look like. Um, or for example, if you're going to apply to replace windows on your building, we would want to see the um, <clears throat> product, the manufacturer's product information telling us what windows you're proposing to use. And this is all just so that part of our review, we make sure that your project is meeting those Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, if you have a very straightforward project like a roof replacement and you have a commercial building with a flat roof, it's membrane and you're putting down a new membrane roof, you would not need to submit specifications for that. So if you've got questions on whether or not your proposed project is going to need additional information like that, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, and so under that same thing, project description, but now this is for survey and national register projects. You'll include a scope of work in the boundary. So basically we wanna know what is the approximate boundary of the survey or a national register um, district that you'll be working on. And then the importance for the village, um, town or the building, why is it important that the building be listed or if it's a municipality coming in for a district, um, which means multiple properties together, we just wanna know, um, you know, why are you looking for the survey to be done? Why are you looking for national register? Why is this important to your building, your community, um, that type of thing. Then we would also like to know the estimated number of resources. If you're coming in for just an individual building, obviously that number is probably going to be one unless you've got outbuildings that are being listed with it. Um, if it's a municipality coming in for an entire district listing or survey, um, of course, you don't have the final number until the final project is completed, but we would like to know approximately how many um, resources such so buildings are we talking, talking about within this boundary. Also, we would want to know, have you discussed this with SHPO? There's a checkbox um, for this question. It's really important that you have talked with the State Historic Preservation Office before you apply for survey or national register projects. This is to make sure that they are in, in um, preliminary agreement that there could be a national register here or that there's something to survey. And then professional consultant proposals. Um, we would want to know who are you looking to work with for this type of um, for this type of project. Generally, when you're doing a historic resources survey or a national register nomination, you would have a preservation consultant working on the project with you. Um, so we just want to know, um, you know, who are you? Who would you be working with, and, and kind of how would they be doing the project? Okay, now moving on to community impact, and this is for the repair and rehabilitation projects. Um, we would start with an explanation of how the building is serving members of the surrounding community and has a positive impact on the community's cultural and social life and economy. So this is a pretty important part of the application, so you want to make sure that you're giving a really good response to this. Um, this is going to be one of those higher um, reviewed sections when the, when the grant review panel is looking over all the applications and doing their ranking and rating. So the purpose of the grant program in general is not only to help fund your projects so that your building is maintained, but also it's, um, you know, should be a building that has a community impact. So uh, you will give a description on, um, you know, talk to us about how how this building, how this project will have that, will have a beneficial impact on the community. That can be anything from um, you own a, you know, a cafe that brings in a lot of foot traffic and that's more, um, more, you know, it, it contributes to the economy of your village or town, um, those types of things, or you offer programming that brings in people, um, talk about those programs. And then how often will the property be open to the public? We wanna understand you know, if you're only open once a year versus are you open every day? What are your hours? So basically under that question, let us know how often um, during the year you open. So if it's 12 months out of the year, say that. 
you could say that it's Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, so we wanna get a good picture of how often does the public have access to your building? Can they use your building? Um, and is the building currently or will the building be accessible to individuals with disabilities? This will not make or break your project, but we do wanna know is your building already ADA accessible? And if not, does your project bring it into ADA accessibility? Um, again, that's just more to understand the project and how people access your building and use your building but it's not necessarily make or break. People often ask, it's not ADA accessible now, but that's not really part of our project. Are we not going to be funded? That's not the case at all. We're just trying to understand the full scope of your building. And then support letters. These are optional, but highly, highly recommended. Um, support letters are, you know, you can get those from anyone from your municipality, somebody with your, um, with your county government, it could be people in your village or town um, talking about how much that building means to them. Um, but letters of support, there's no number on how many you should have, but these are very beneficial when it comes to reviewing the grant applications because it tells us that other people care about this project as well, that there really is a benefit beyond maybe what, what you think it is. Um, so I think that support letters, while they're optional, Again, we highly recommend that you submit letters of support with your application. And then community impact for the Survey National Register projects. Um, here you would explain again how the project will serve members of the surrounding community and has a positive impact on the community's cultural and social life and economy. Um, you know, tell us, a little more about you know why why this national register nomination or survey how does it benefit the community most of the time that answer is going to be so that people can use the state and federal tax credit programs which again has multiplying impacts positive impacts to a community when when those financial um, incentives are available you also need to check whether or not you're in an eligible census tract um, that's because again, usually when you're doing national register listing, it's so that the ultimate purpose is for, um, for building owners, both commercial and residential, to be able to use tax credit programs. But to, in New York State, to be eligible for that state program, you do have to be in an eligible census tract. There are instructions um, on how to find that out. But if you have questions, again, reach out to me and we'll get that information for you and help you find that. And again, like, like the capital work, um, letters of support, optional, but highly recommended again. Okay, and then we move on to the community need. This is another, um, another well, they're all important aspects of your application, um, but this one really helps the, the grant review panel when it comes to ranking and rating and determining, you know, which projects are really having a benefit to the community, which projects are really needed to be done in order to save a building or um, yeah, to have an impact. So when we look at that, we're going to ask you for the population of your village or town. Again, this is partially so that we can check to make sure that you are actually an eligible applicant um, and meet those requirements. Um, and again, that needs to be within an incorporated village or town. So if you're in a hamlet or any other little type of um, Little, little type of place. Those are not incorporated right. things. Uh, you do need to make sure that you are um, in an incorporated village or town. And if you are in a hamlet, please use the town population. We also need the population of the county and then the percent below poverty level. And you'll find in the application instructions, we included links to help you find this information and how, and how to put that together, the, the poverty level. Um, so that should be fairly straightforward once you have the application instructions. Like I said, there's links to the websites where you get this information from. And then explain how your project will meet a local need in the community. Um, so for example, if your building provides a public meeting space, um, clarify whether the community lacks other public meeting spaces or cost-free meeting spaces and yours provides you know, cost-free meeting space um, or the size of the meeting space, you know, all other all other public meeting spaces in your town or village only hold up to 10 people, but you know there's a need for a place that holds up to 50 and that's what yours will do. Um, is the community experience, experiencing population loss or disinvestment? 
um, or is the project um, filling a previously vacant or underlized, underutilized building or space? So um, that would be the community needs section. Now we get into the funding need. Um, and for those of you who applied during round one, you will probably breathe a little sigh of relief when you get to section six and seven. We don't have that budget worksheet table this time around. It makes much more clear, ask questions about your actual funding needs. Um, so to start with, we'll talk about the grant funding. Um, is it public or private grant funds? We wanna know if you have had any public or private grant funds received in the last five years. This is mainly under the funding need. This information is so that we understand, you know, have you been working on the building? Is this an ongoing process for you? Um, those types of things. So any public or private grants that you've received in the last five years on that specific building, not your organization, but on that specific building you're applying for. Um, and then a brief explanation of why this project needs funding, what financial needs have already been addressed and where the gaps are in funding. Um, so if the project is also receiving tax credits or other grant funding, please make sure you put that in the section. We do want to know that as well. And then finally, we want you to explain any repercussions if the project doesn't receive the giver grant funding. Um, again, of course, we know that most, most every project that applies is a well-deserving project. Um, and we just want to know what are the actual repercussions. If it's going to mean make or break for the building and it's structured to remain standing, let us know that. If it means that a store is going to be closed and that's jobs lost and um, income lost, let us know that. So um, make sure you let us know what that is. Again, the repercussion doesn't guarantee that you'll get the funding, it just helps us understand the need. Then we move into project budget and the grant request. And this is the section where I said, you will not have the table that you had during the round one application. This one here is going to ask specific questions that you'll fill in blanks to. So you'll start with briefly describing how the budget and cost were determined. This is where you're going to include contractor, consultant and vendor estimates. Um, in round two, this is required. We need this so that we make sure that what you're requesting and the work you're doing makes sense. We don't want to fund somebody $50,000 if they only really have a $10,000 project and vice versa. If your project is going to cost a lot more than what you're requesting, we want to make sure that, that you're requesting the appropriate amount for, for what you're doing and where you're getting those numbers from. A lot of people have been asking who applied in round one, do I need to get updated contractor consultant estimates? Um, I would say it is not a requirement. However, again, highly, highly recommended. Um, since the round one applications were due, things have changed and you know, some, um, some costs have gone up in the building construction world. We wanna make sure that, that you are getting the correct, you're requesting the amount that you'll actually need and it's a realistic number. So if you just reach out to your contractor, if you, if you submitted in round one and included that, reach out to your contractor, ask if the numbers have changed. If not, just have them update the date on your estimate so that it reflects that it's a current estimate. Um, you'll list other potential and actual sources of financial support for the project. Um, this is where we want to know, are you going to be using any of your personal funds? Do you have a loan on the project? Do you have any other, um, you know, will you be getting a loan to cover the cost of the project for now? Um, and, you know, if your project goes above because there is the $50,000 maximum, uh, award that you can receive. If your project goes beyond $50,000, we just want to know, you know, how, how is the full project being paid for? For municipalities only, uh, we asked the question of how would grant funding complement funding allocated for building maintenance and repair through the town, village, or county budget? So we want to understand um, the, the municipality budget and why the grant is being requested versus what you have allocated towards maintenance of the building. And often we know that um, you know, those allocations towards maintenance and repair of your counter village buildings sometimes have unexpected unforeseen um, costs that aren't part of the original budget. So just let us know that. Um, and then how will this project be paid for upfront? So it's very, very, very important that you understand this is a reimbursable grant, meaning the work gets done first, then you get reimbursed the grant money. 
So we want to know how you'll be able to pay for that work up front, whether that's personal funds, but then the grant will reimburse and, and refill your account, um, whether that's a loan that you'll take from a bank, whether you have a private funder who's willing to, to loan the money until you get the reimbursement. But basically, the grant review panel needs to know that you, if funded, will actually move forward with the project because you have some type of funding in place to pay for this until you get reimbursed with the grant. Then we will ask you your total project costs. So that's um, back a few slides ago when I talked about how you're going to talk about all of the ongoing work to your building. We want to know the total project cost for the work that will be going on while you're doing this grant application and, and grant program. Um, if that's you know $250,000 worth of work, write that on this line. Then you'll have the line where you put your grant request, and that's where you put in anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000. Um, then you want to make sure that you're aware, as I mentioned earlier, that preparation of any architectural or engineering plans and specifications can't exceed more than 20% of your total grant amount, meaning if, if you receive the grant, no more than 20% of what you receive can go towards reimbursement of those architectural plans or specifications. So that's just something to be aware of as you're applying. Right, um, then there's a section on applicant capacity. And the purpose of this section is just to ensure that the applicant will be able to successfully oversee the grant project if awarded. Um, so the applicant needs to show their ability to track and report expenses, um, and then also outlay cash to pay the contractor or the consultants prior to reimbursement, what we were just talking about. Um, and then the fact that once you do this project, you have to be able to go through the process with the state to submit that paperwork to request the reimbursement. So we are basically just looking to make sure that you've got somebody in your group um, or somebody that's helping you with this, if, if it's not you, that makes sure that this project is, is um, happening on time and that all of these um, processes and the grant agreement can be signed and that you understand the paperwork that's done with the state when that happens. Um, Basically, we highly recommend ensuring that the project team has a dedicated person on their team that will oversee all the aspects of this grant, um, from submission of the application to the final reimbursement and close out of the grant process with the state. Um, and although we at the Landmark Society and at the State Historic Preservation Office can provide guidance on your projects, we cannot manage your project for you. So you wanna make sure that you do have somebody on your team that can help walk you through this process. And of course, we're here to help you through it if this is your first grant. Um, like I said, we're here to provide guidance. We just can't actually do the management of the grant for you. So we want to know, you know, how will you ensure a timely and organized completion of the project? Um, explain how you'll track your expenditures and reimbursement requests. So of course, you want to make sure that you're holding on to all of your um, to all of your uh, invoices and proof of payment things that you'll then later submit to the state to be reimbursed. Um, and then how will you make sure the project stays on schedule and within budget? Of course, we know every project, knock on wood, but every project always has something that comes up. So we're aware of that. Um, so we're not saying if you get off track a little, that's a problem, but we wanna know how you're going to make sure this project stays on track and actually is completed. And then the final, portion of the applicant capacity section is just a checkbox. You just need to check saying that you are aware that the National Register of Historic Places needs to be um, completed if it's if the building's not already listed. So that's just you confirming that you know that if funded and you're not already listed, you have to move forward with the listing to receive the grant reimbursement. Okay, and then again, um, eligible and ineligible eligible and ineligible expenses when it comes to what you can be reimbursed for. Um, so of course, as we already talked about, um, eligible expenses are your capital improvement costs and it's part of or permanently attached to the building. And that's a lot of those things that we discussed earlier, which are on the left-hand side of your screen, roofing, windows, weatherization, structural work, um, those types of things. And then of course, your historic resources surveys or your national register nominations, all eligible costs. Ineligible costs include um, things like furniture and landscaping, like we talked about before, but also things like personnel or salaries associated with anyone in your organization or business that will be working on this. You can't claim those costs. Um, travel, gas, and meals, 
Um, I know sometimes contractors will build those into their into their estimates. That's that's one thing, but you can't actually have um, staff that's traveling to do this or you traveling back and forth to, to oversee the project. Those travel expenses are not eligible to be reimbursed by the grant. Same thing with office supplies and materials or equipment. So if, if they're having to rent, um, if they're having to rent, I don't know, a, a lift to be able to get up to upper windows, that lift isn't eligible, but the window work is. Um, and then tools, so things like hammers, saws, things like that um, are not eligible expenses. All right, so support letters and attachments. Um, again, your contractor, consultant, and vendor estimates need to be attached to your application. These are required again so that we make sure that you have a realistic number that you are um, requesting in your application. Letters of support need to be attached to the end of your application. Again, these are not required, but highly, highly, and I can't say that enough, highly recommended. Um, and then you'll also need to submit photographs. So you need exterior and interior representative photographs. It doesn't necessarily have to be of the entire building, but we need to have a good picture of what your building looks like and these also help the grant review panel to understand the need um, portion of your application. If they can't see what's happening with your building, it's hard to fully understand that need. The number of photographs really depends on the size of your building, the complexity of your project and what you're applying for. But um, if you are applying for interior work, we still need exterior photos of your building. We wanna make sure we know what that building looks like. Drawings and sketches should be attached. Again, these are applicable to projects that are making um, layout or design changes like a storefront or you're putting in new apartments on the upper floor. We wanna see you know, what is that layout going to be. Um, and then that would also include existing demolition and proposed plans for projects like that. We wanna see you know, what is the existing floor plan? What are you removing and what are you putting back in? Specifications, which are your pro, um, product details. Again, that's that comes into play if you are going to be requesting to replace windows. We want to make sure that what you're replacing them with will be appropriate. Um, things like that. You'll also need to include a map. This could be as simple as taking a snapshot of a of a of the map on Google and put a big X or some type of mark over where your building is. We can see where where its location is. And then there's also an application checklist at the end of the application. You just want to make sure that you go through and check that all off. That's more for your benefit, just to make sure you're not forgetting to submit anything that, that needs to be submitted. Again, um, because your application does have to be completed electronically, all of these attachments would be attached as PDFs into one document with your application. There are instructions. Um, in your application instructions on how to make how to combine this all into one PDF in the end. Um, and I think if you are having issues with that, you want to try to find somebody who can help you who can help you create one document. Um, but the application does include a or the instructions include a few websites where you can um, go to to get the free combining program. So basically, you just upload your different PDFs you have, hit combine, and it does that for you. Um, so there are a few options in the instructions to help you with that. Okay, the application evaluation. So basically these applications will be evaluated by your grant review panel um, with the following categories. This is what the ranking and rating and scoring comes from. So there's funding priorities, um, then project description, community impact, community need, your funding need, the budget schedule and scope, the applicant capacity, and the overall completeness of your application. So we do wanna make sure you know that with the application, we will not be accepting um, continuation sheets this time around. You do need to make sure that all of your responses are within the box provided in the application form. So while that will limit how much you write, you wanna make sure that you are succinctly and, and um, directly answering the questions you want to make sure you give enough information so that you're really talking up, um, you know, the need and the community impact and the benefit of your project. Um, but you don't want a whole lot of extra fluff with it. Um, so just do make sure that that you're aware of that, that you can't accept continuation sheets this time. So your responses do need to be put within the um, 
it within the fields provided in the application form itself. So to touch base very quickly on those Secretary of the Interior standards that I had mentioned your work needs to comply with. These again are guidelines set forth by the National Park Service, um, basically just on, on standards for the treatment of historic properties. Uh, they're used to review both state and federally funded projects. So um, if you're funded through this giver program, it is federal funding come down to the state. So you do have to meet these standards. Um, there are 10 standards, but the four key points you get out of them are that buildings are used for the historic purpose or a new purpose that does not require significant alterations of the historic building. So if you have a historic um, a, a historic tavern building, but you're going to be using it for um, for a storefront now and you're going to you're going to have a business in there that's fine you can change the use of a building we're just making sure that you aren't you know taking down the facade of a building completely altering what it looks like for that new use um, you want to retain the historic materials and features to the greatest extent possible those are what make your building historically significant and then where it deteriorated beyond repair um, that the historic materials and features are replaced in kind and that alterations and additions must not destroy historic materials and must be compatible. Um, with that last one, I just wanna note that you can do additions to your building. However, new construction is not an eligible expense for this program. It does have to be to the historic building. If there's a non-historic addition already on your building, then work within that is still eligible. Okay, benefits of national register listing. For those of you who don't already have a building listed in the National Register, you're probably wondering, well, what good does it do for me to get listed? Um, it is an honorary designation. So um, there is no restriction on what a private property owner can or can't do to their building. It doesn't have any type of um, protection on the building. So it can't protect your building from, let's say, being demolished. It is just an honorary designation that helps promote heritage tourism and economic development raise awareness your community doesn't always know what they've got in front of them and what, and what that means um, national register listing also makes you eligible for state and federal historic tax credit programs um, and other historic um, preservation grant and loan programs so there are real benefits to being listed in the national register And finally, just some uh, reminders and deadlines. Your round two application is due March 31st, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. Um, if you're having issues with sending things, um, please let me know so that we're aware of that ahead of time. Um, if you are trying to submit the application and it's not letting you do it through um, just attachment to an email because the files are too big, you can put everything into like a Dropbox and then send us the Dropbox link so that we'll still have your full application. Do be aware that when you are submitting this, your application itself and all of your attachment materials need to be in PDF format in one PDF document. However, your photographs are not part of that. Your photographs get submitted as individual JPEGs. That's the images, like when you take it on your camera, it will automatically be that type of file. You do need to label your images though and there are application, there's instructions in the application on how to do that. Basically, we want you to label it with what your building is and a very brief, um, you know, looking at the first, like first floor, telling us what we're looking at in the photo. And that's so that we understand where we're looking at the, um, when we're looking through your photos, we understand where we are in the building. Um, again, there are instructions on how to do that, how to change the file name in the application instructions. Um, if you're having issues, just let me know. But application form one pdf your images come are submitted separately as jpeg images we are available landmark society staff we're available to answer questions and provide support um, as i mentioned earlier we can also try to set up site visits so you can sort of ignore the january 15th deadline um, but again site visits will be um, will be reserved for those projects that have more complicated scopes of work or a, a um, or have a lot more work that needs to be done and you need some guidance on where to start and what you should be applying for first. Um, 
so we will try to fit in site visit requests to the greatest extent that we can and within time for you to still have plenty of time to complete your application before the deadline. Um, if you've got questions, please contact me. My contact information is there on the screen. Megan Clem, I'm the preservation planner here at the Landmark Society. My email is mclem at landmarksociety.org, or you can reach me at the phone number provided. Um, often email is going to be the quickest way to get in touch with me, but you're welcome to call as well. And again, if you've got questions, please email my mclem at landmarksociety.org. That should be the email you use for any questions you have leading up to the, to the grant application submission. However, when you go to submit your final application, that's when you'll use the gvrr at landmarksociety.org. Please make sure that you're submitting your application to that, to that um, email address so that we know that it's been received. And with that, I think that's um, all we've got for our presentation. I would like to open it up now if we've got questions in the chat or if somebody has a question they haven't put in the chat, you can um, raise your hand. We will open this up for Great. questions. Thanks, Megan. Um, so yeah, we've got several questions that have been coming in on the chat. Reminder, if you do have a question, just start dumping them in the chat and we will get to them. So first question, um, our proposed handicap accessibility project on our 1838 Academy oh. building would require replacing a non-ADA compliant walkway with a poured concrete sidewalk. Um, so, you know, would that, the question is, would that be considered site work um, or would it be considered part of the building and is it eligible? That's a really great question. Um, I think that sort of thing, sidewalks would be considered site work. I think um, eligible ADA type things would be if you're putting in an exterior lift or something like that. But if it's just a sidewalk itself, um, I'm gonna say that's probably site work. We might wanna talk to you outside of this on an individual basis to get the full scope of, of what that would include. Yeah, when I first read that question, I was thinking, um, you know, it was a ramp up to the building. But yeah, if it's, if it's I would say, you know, if it's not like a, integral part of the building, if it's truly a separate sidewalk, then yeah, that probably would be site work. So I'm glad that we covered that. So yeah, definitely reach out to Megan um, if you've got you know, a specific case like that and we can hash that out. Um, so I think uh, this question came in um, kind of earlier before you got to this, but just to reiterate, is it required that a project be eligible for listing in the National Register in order to apply? Yes, and I am glad that someone asked this question again because I did not during the presentation make sure that everyone understands. If your building is not already listed and you need that determination of eligibility from the state, again, there's instructions in the application instructions on how to, how to do that. Um, but you do need to make sure that you're reaching out soon. I would say sooner rather than later to the state to get that determination. There's some information that you do have to submit to them in order for them to make the determination. And when you submit your application on March 31st, you need to have their determination of eligibility letter included with your submission. So um, you wanna make sure you're reaching out to them sooner rather than later. And again, if you've got questions about this, feel free to reach out to me, but there are instructions on how to, how to move forward with that process in the application. Megan, I'm sorry, you may have said this while I was reading a question. What, is there a specific deadline to submit that eligibility request to SHPO? Good point. So there's not necessarily a deadline, but I would say that you don't want to send your request in any more than maybe a month prior to the deadline. So I'd say by mid end of February, end of February at the latest is when you want to submit your request to SHPO. Um, their reviewers have a lot of stuff going on and while they've been great in, in getting through these determinations quickly for us, um, depending on the information you submit to them, they may come back to you and ask for additional information. So just be aware of that. So I would say if you want to make sure you have this letter from them in time for your giver submission, I would make sure that you do you submit your request to them no later than the end of February. And for your own benefit, you know, if SHPO determines that your building is not eligible, you don't want to go full ahead and put all that effort into your grant application. Right. So yeah. And if you apply during round one and if you're not already listed and you applied during round one and already got an eligible determination, you don't need to redo that process. Just 
you're already eligible. Good point. So we have a couple of questions about cost estimates. Do you need to do do applicants need to get more than one cost estimate? So for the purpose of submitting the grant application, no, you can just do one cost estimate. Um, of course, it's always to your benefit to maybe talk to a couple different contractors just to make sure you know you can see your options, see if their prices are fluctuating a lot. Um, that's just to protect you. If you talk to one person and they severely underestimate the cost, but you've got another person who said it was going to be a lot more, you might you might want then to submit a request for the higher number that someone gave you. So not required, but maybe in your best interest, talk to a couple different people. So for someone who applies who isn't let excuse me who isn't yet listed in the National Register or their building isn't yet listed. Um, but they're determined eligible, they go ahead and apply, let's say they get funding, can they be reimbursed? Um, can they get the grant reimbursement dispersed to them before the National Register listing is finalized? So this is a really good question and one that we have been asking the state um, because this is really up to the state. It's our understanding that you do need to have the listing in place to get the grant reimbursement. However, um, I think they have kind of said that if you have at least a draft of the nomination into them so they can see, I believe they would be able to release the, the, re, the grant reimbursement then. So if you were to finish the work before your nomination is completed, as long as they have a draft, I do believe that you'll be able to get that reimbursement because they know that, that it's actually coming. If they don't have a draft, the reason they can't release those funds yet is because they don't actually know yet that you're really doing a nomination. Um, is there a benefit to a grant application if it includes plans that support the 200th anniversary of Frederick Law Olmsted's birthday as a means of promoting the property to the community? Wait, can you, can you repeat so that I again? I think the applicant is saying, you know, um, if the building for which they're applying funding is, is somehow involved in celebrating the 200th anniversary of Olmsted's birthday. Um, is that, does that help boost kind of the community impact argument? Um, I would say, I would say yes, it could help, but you wanna make sure that you really talk about the building itself and how that impacts it. So are the grounds being used for something specific that the building is on, but at the same time is the building be like our, bathrooms in the building going to be open to the public or, or kind of how how does the building tie to the Frederick Law Olmstead? Um, you know, so it, it wouldn't be a community impact just because it's tied to Frederick Law Olmstead. It need you need to make that um, I don't know what am I trying to say, Caitlin? Yeah, I think what you're trying to say, you know, it needs to be an ongoing community impact. I mean certainly if your building is somehow involved in some kind of major important historical uh, um, celebration, um, anniversary, that's great to mention that, but you really, the community impact is really looking at how is this building and its use benefiting the larger community, you know, not just for one day or one month or one year, what is the larger long-term benefit to the community, whether that's economic benefit, social, cultural, um, all of the above. Yes. So I would say, yeah, that can be a small piece of your argument. Um, okay, question on contractors. I had an issue finding contractors to come out. Is there a list of contractors to contact? Um, that's part one. Is there, how, how can we get some more contractors? How we get contractors to show up and give estimates? Yes, so I know that that can be hard right now just in general, but um, you can reach out to me, mclem at landmarksociety.org. We do have um, a list of contractors that we know have worked on historic buildings, um, please be aware that if we send you some names, it is not a, an endorsement from the Landmark Society. These are just um, people that we have had um, by word of mouth told to us that have worked on historic buildings and are known to have done good work. So of course, it will not be an endorsement from us, but we can provide you with some contractor names. And I think we had a couple, we have a couple questions about for, for folks who applied in round one, um and had letters of support can they just recycle those should they get new ones what's what's the feedback on that i think we have i think we covered that question in the first webinar too and i 
hopefully we give the same answer. I, th yeah. I think our answer, um, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. I think that our answer was that you should really ideally get those, at least ask the person who wrote it to update the date. Um, mm -hmm. Cause it just, it looks, but it's gonna look better to the review panel if those are current letters. Right, I think it shows that, you know, the people who wrote letters of support the first time around are still in support of your project. I would assume they would be, it would be weird if they weren't, but who knows in the meantime. So you just wanna make sure, I think it's more for, for the person who wrote the letter too, to be aware that, you're, that you are applying again and that they're still on board with the project. Okay, I'm gonna try and read the, uh, I, I think I know what this question is getting at. Um, so bear with me as I read it. Um, we can break it down if needed. Uh, okay, so if the, if the um, project for which you're applying is part of a larger overall pro project scope, um, and the scope of work for the grant exceeds the grant award amount. So, you know, let's say you get whatever, $20,000 and your project costs 50,000. Can reimbursement be made for the work completed, not the entire project? So I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, it would be, you have a larger scope of work going on at the building. Can you be reimbursed for the portion of your grant project that's finished before the whole project is finished? That answer is yes. To be reimbursed for your grant project, you, that grant work just has to be done. The scope of work for your grant, you don't necessarily. So for example, if you have a completely vacant building and you're putting in um, you know, some type of commercial use on the first floor and you're doing upper floor residential units, and your grant is to um, replace the roof and do some repointing on the exterior masonry and you get the roof replaced and the exterior masonry is done, but you don't have say the apartments on the upper floor aren't done yet. That's not part of your grant project. So that's not a problem. As long as your roof and the repointing is done and you show that it's done, you can be reimbursed. Great. What is the question. <laughs> what is the total funding available for this round? In this round, we have just over $350,000. Um, the total that we had was about 750 and we somewhat, we tried to um, split it in half for the two rounds. Um, in round one, the way it worked out, we just have a little bit more in round two to give out. So it is approximately just over 350,000 to give out in round two. And next question, can our building and business owner still request the updated version of the round two application? Yes, so you can, realistically, you can request the application for me up until March 31st. Um, I would highly recommend reaching out sooner than later just because, you know, it is, it'll take a bit of time to complete the application, but yes. And I, you, you covered this, but we'll just, just reiterate, um, Someone was asking, you know, what's the responsiveness of the State Preservation Office, SHPO, over the next 60 days, you know, given that we're living, you know, still living in COVID time. Um, and, you know, I think I would just reiterate, if, if your building is not already listed in the National Register and you need to get that determination of National Register eligibility, get your request in sooner than later, as soon as possible, but definitely no later than what was the date you gave, Megan? <laughs> I would do it no later than the very end of February. Just they have time. Um, when you re when you put in your submission request, so this is it's you're going to go through the state website, and again, this is all in the application instructions. So if you haven't reached out to me yet for the application instructions, do that soon. Um, but there are fields that you have to fill in on in on their website when you're doing the submission, and part of what they're going to ask is is kind of like why you're asking for this determination and you would put in that for why you're asking for the determination put in that it's for the giver or the Genesee Valley Rural Revitalization Grant. Um, what I found in round one is when people did that the um, SHPO staff kind of gave those priority because they knew there was a deadline coming up. Now with that said I'm not SHPO staff so I can't guarantee that they do that again I'm just saying they've been very cooperative and very helpful in that way. Um, when you fill that in, but you want to make sure you're not submitting that request a week before your application is due. Uh, if you applied in round one but weren't funded, can you get feedback on your application? Yes, if you reach out to me, and I know there's a few people that I still owe feedback to, and I will get that out to you this week. 
Um, but if you have not requested feedback yet and you applied in round one, um, yes, send me an email at mclem at landmarksociety.org and I will get you feedback on your round one application. So um, we do have a question. I think, you know, I did, just to clarify, someone was asking, is the SHPO check-in new? We applied in round one and just want to make sure that this is not a new requirement. So again, you only need to be in touch with the State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO if your building is not already listed in the National Register. If you applied in round one and your building wasn't already listed, you already went through that determination of eligibility process. So um, theoretically, if you applied in round one, you don't need to reach out to SHPO for anything. Um, um, and again, you only need to reach out to them if your building is not already listed in the National Register. Right, and during the presentation, the only other um, like check-in with SHPO mentioned is if you're applying to do a historic resources survey or a National Register nomination, and you want to have that covered by the grant, you do need to check in with, with the SHPO staff and the contact information is in there um, because we just need to make sure that what you're applying for funded, that they've already had a preliminary look at what you're doing and said, yes, there's something there. We just, we don't wanna fund say a national register project that SHPO has never seen, takes a look at and says, there's no district here. So that's why we have that check-in requirement. That's a good point. So again, just to reiterate, reiterate what Megan said, most folks, at least in round one, most folks were applying for building repairs, physical capital improvements to their buildings. But if you're applying, your community is applying to do a survey or a national register nomination in your community, that that is another case where you would check in with the SHPO. Right. Um, and while we're still on that topic, I should also probably clarify, if you only have a determination of eligibility, you're not listed yet. Um, as we mentioned over and over, if you are funded, you have to get listed. Part of the um, application is going to ask about um, how you're paying for the National Register nomination. So again, if you need to be listed, you can apply for a portion of your, um, for that cost to have the nomination written, can be covered by the giver grant. If it's not going to be covered by the giver grant, so you would want to talk to a, a preservation consultant and have an estimate to turn in so that we know that you know, you're, you're asking for the right amount for that as well. Um, but if you, where was I going with this? Um, so you wanna make sure that you have that, but if you are not going to use giver grant funding to help cover your national register nomination, you do need to let us know in the application how you're paying for that nomination. The reason you have to do that is because again, the grant review panel wants to know and wants to be able to verify that if funded, you will move forward with the nomination. So if you get funded and you're not using giver grant funding to help cover the cost of your national register nomination how are you paying for it because you will have to move forward with that nomination so we need to know that you have funding for that some other way and then somewhat related to that the next question we have is can we get a commitment that they the state will release funds, the grant funds upon submission of a nominations. This is a significant risk to apply and have a no determination ultimately disqualify reimbursement. Um, so I think the, the way the process is set up, that's not a risk. That's not something that would happen. I and mean, you're gonna have a contract, if you get awarded a grant, you're going to have a very detailed contract that the state writes with you. Um, and part of that contract will, will stipulate that the National Register listing um, has to be completed if you aren't already listed. Um, right, and that's yeah. part of the, if you're going to be doing that. So if you are applying for both, you know, capital actual work to your building and for the cost of the National Register nomination, you would be filling out both of those sections in the application. If you're only doing capital work, you don't need to fill out the questions about National Register or survey, or vice versa. If you're only doing National Register or survey, you wouldn't fill out the section that was for the capital projects only. But that's the purpose of reaching out to SHPO ahead of time is that you're already going to know that they think there's something there. Really what the National Register nomination process will then do is officially list the building, but also make that final determination if it's a district, let's say, on what the boundary is. Um, if it's an individual building, that's not really a concern. So basically by the time you are awarded funding, if you're awarded, you're going to know that your National Register nomination will be accepted by SHPO, you just have to write the nomination. 
Yeah, and that's really good. And Sandy chimed in with, with, with a clarification on that. So I'm really glad you did that, Sandy. Yes, the, the state will not deny your national register listing request once, that's the whole point of doing that determination of eligibility before you apply. That's the state preservation office officially saying, yes, your building is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Now, the next step is on you, the property owner, to put to, to either put together an application, your, no, put together a nomination, a National Register nomination yourself, or hire a consultant to put together a quality nomination that you can then submit to the State Historic Preservation Office. So they will have to make sure that that nomination meets state and federal standards. Um, but it's not like they're gonna say, oh yeah, we told you it was eligible, but just kidding, it's not really. Um, it will, unless you do something to it, you know, tear down half the building, it will remain eligible if they determine that it was national eligible before you apply. So great cl clarification. Thank you, Sandy. Any other questions? Um, we're right about at the end time here, but if anybody wants to put any last minute questions in the chat, we can cover those. These are great, great questions. It's good for everyone to hear. If you have a question, chances are someone else does. So it's great for everyone else to hear it. Give and me another meantime, few seconds. In the meantime too, just um, know if you applied in round one, round two, the application should be a bit more smooth of a process to complete. Um, we're asking all the same questions, but a few, a few of them, we've changed up how we word the questions, so it makes a little more sense. Um, the budget worksheet section is, is much more refined now. There's not that confusing chart going on. Um, and then, of course, you know, as I said before, if you've got questions while you're filling this out, we certainly don't want you to feel overwhelmed. Please reach out to me if you've got questions. I can't fill out your application for you. Um, but I can give you pointers and some guidance if you need that. Um, and I certainly would say if you are someone who, you know, I, I've talked to people who have said I'm just not that great with technology, um, I would make sure you find someone in your organization, in your village who might help you if you go to your village office or if there's like a development corporation, sometimes they've got people on staff who are more than happy to help with grant applications. Um, so just find that person who can help you out to put this all together. Um, but certainly we don't want you to feel overwhelmed with this. Um, so please do reach out with questions. And I would just say a general piece of advice, you know, when you're doing any grant application, keep in mind that the people reviewing it, we have a grant review panel. It's composed of preservation professionals, um, grassroots preservationists, architects, folks from all across the state, some folks who live in New York City, um, someone from Buffalo, Binghamton. So um, folks may have never been to your community and have no idea what it looks like. So in your grant, you really need to be painting a picture of your building, your community, the state of your community, the economic need in your community, the social need, whatever, you know, kind of niche your building is filling, really paint a picture and, you know, make a case for why you deserve funding. Um, you know, you don't, we've limited the amount of space you can write in, so you, you can't go on and on too much, um, but, you know, be, be, be a little bit, think of this as a kind of a persuasive essay. It's not just stating the facts. You really want to be making your case for why you deserve funding and how your building um, has a positive impact on your community. Right, and it's really important, you know, kind of you know, responding how Caitlin was just saying, because you have to remember too that, um, you know, this this grant program is wonderful, but it is competitive. So we are, have limited funding for who applies, you know, so you really need to make the case for your building and know that, um, you know, just writing in the, in in for like community impact or the need, if you just write that, you know, this building is important and it should be done, well, that's probably not an answer that's going to get you far with our grant review panel because you got to remember there's other applicants applying too who have buildings in a state of disrepair just like yours or you know those types of things so you want to make sure you're really stating the case making the argument for your building um you know a one sentence response to some of the questions i'm not saying all the questions but for example that where you're talking about the work that you're applying for or your community the community impact part the community impact and benefit and the need you know, a one sentence response is probably not enough. 
Um, so you just wanna make sure you're really making the case for your building, knowing that this is a competitive grant program. Yes, and it's not, you're not just, we're not just focusing on historic significance. You know, I mean, certainly you're, we can probably assume that all of your buildings are important, historically significant, architecturally significant in your communities. But we wanna know, this is kind of a forward looking grant. We wanna know present and future contributions that your building is making or is going to make at an economic, social, cultural, et cetera level. Um, so yeah, I don't see any other questions that have come in. So if you do have questions that occur to you in the middle of the night, just email Megan at mclem at landmarksociety.org. And don't forget, as you see at the bottom of the slide, that when you do submit your final grant application to Megan, that's going to be to the giver, the GVRR at landmarksociety.org email address. Right. And I do just want to make very clear, too, um, if you are going to apply in round two, you do need to reach out directly to me for the application. We are keeping a, a list of those who have reached out and we've sent it to. When it comes to the deadline, we can only accept applications from people who reached out to me directly for the application. So if you share the application with somebody else, um, be aware that if they didn't reach out to me, their application won't be accepted. So you do wanna make sure you reach out directly to me. Yeah, I will just restate that. If you have not emailed Megan directly as the applicant yourself, if you then turn in an application form that you got from someone else besides Megan, your application will not be moved on for consideration to the grant review panel. So you must, you must email Megan. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to, to hearing about your projects, to reviewing your applications. Um, and just remember, if you don't get funded, this is an extremely competitive program. And it's not the end of the road. Our staff will be happy to work with you to find other funding opportunities and discuss other ideas. Um, and thank you for your time this morning. Thank and you. we will get this recording up on the, our website in the next few days and send you all a link. All right, have a good day.